Welcome to Hal Land, the place where 60s pop culture collides with the 90s. This week's special visitor in Hal Land, direct from Gilligan's Island, is Mrs. Thurston Howell III. Oh, lovely. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, here he is, the king of Hal Land, that multimedia mensch. Hal Lifson! Hooray! <laughs> All right, thank you, thank you. Welcome to Hal Land. How you doing? We got quite a show today. We're going to look at some of the January releases from Archie Comics. We're going to read a couple Hal Land fan letters. And uh, before I get into the show, I want to get myself a little bowl of Lucky Charms to feel comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> hey, well, wait a second, wait a second. Sparky, I told you it's in my contract. The green marshmallows are supposed to be taken out of the cereal before taping. <laughs> All right, now, for some of my regular viewers, you're probably wondering, hey, Hal looks a little different. Something's changed. Well, I'm going to be honest. I succumbed to a very L.A. narcissistic drive, and I had some cosmetic surgery recently. Uh, in an attempt to look more distinguished and intellectual, I had most of the hair surgically removed from my head. <laughs> uh, I don't know, the doctor told me there's a 50-50 chance that the hair might grow back and I'll have to go through the 90s looking like Bobby Sherman, you know, with a shag haircut. He even gave me a pair of glasses to wear to kind of accentuate the look. I don't know, I, I, I look smarter, but I, I feel stupid. Anyway, we have a couple fan letters I'd like to get to. Uh, the first one is from a guy we all know from the Brady Bunch, Mr. Greg Brady. <laughs> Greg writes, Dear Hal, I want to apologize again for having to postpone my visit to Hal Land. I've hit some pretty hard times recently and was even turned down for a job as MC at a monster truck rally. <laughs> I've even had to move back into the top bunk in Bobby and Peter's room. <laughs> but things are looking up. My wife has just locked up a reoccurring role as an extra on Jake and the Fat Man. <laughs> and my family has just been signed for a new, updated TV series for yuppies. It's called Brady Something. <laughs> I look forward to watching Welcome to Hal Land each week on Alice's portable black and white TV. And by the way, you'll be proud to know I was just hired as director of syrup maintenance at the International House of Pancakes. <laughs> Sincerely, Greg Brady. <laughs> Say hi to Marcia for me, all right, Skippy? <laughs> Our next letter is from uh, Captain James T. Kirk of the USS <laughs> Enterprise. <laughs> Captain Kirk writes, Dear Hal, I try to catch your show every time I pass through the Alpha Centauri system. As a matter of fact, I've seen all 347 episodes of Welcome to Hal Land, which up here is already in reruns. <laughs> I missed your show last week because I confused my hand phaser with the remote control and accidentally disintegrated my television. <laughs> I'd love to visit Hal Land sometime, so please feel free to beam me down at your convenience. And by the way, now that I've seen how popular the new captain is on the Star Trek the Next Generation show, I finally decided to stop wearing my toupee. <laughs> Jim, I've been telling you you got to lose the toupee for 20 years. <laughs> I mean, seriously. It, uh, it looks like an alien's resting on top of your head. <laughs> In any event, uh, as I mentioned at the top of the show, I'm going to quickly review some of the January releases uh, from Archie Comics. Uh, the first, uh, Sparky, can we get a close-up here? This is just generic Archie, and uh, this is the comic where we can just read uh, the adventures of Archie and the gang, Betty and Veronica. All the main characters are intact in this issue. Uh, so I would say this is for your Archie purist. Issue number 248 of Everything's Archie takes a slightly different slant on the Archie concept. Here we see the Archie's musical group, and this would obviously appeal to someone in the music industry. Uh, in this particular issue, Archie breaks off as a solo artist uh, and leaves the Archie's group. 
and the Archies replace him with Danny Bonaducci of the Partridge family. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, the Archies get involved in a payola scandal and uh, in an attempt to promote their new record, uh, find themselves thrown out of the music industry temporarily. <laughs> Another new title from Archie is Archie 3000. This places the Archie characters into the future. Uh, it sort of has a Jetsons angle to it. If we can maybe get a little close up of the artwork, we see some very futuristic Archie stylings. And I think this comic will appeal to uh, anyone obsessed with the next century. <laughs> this is the classic Betty and Veronica comic that we know people like Elvis Presley and Dick Cavett are famous for reading each month. Uh, this tends to appeal to a heavy female demographic, but uh, I don't know, it's still one of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, last, we have Archie's Pals and Gals. Uh, this is, again, a group concept featuring the Archies in a diner, uh, always involved in group dilemmas, not really focusing on any one character in particular. Although in this uh, issue, Reggie's narcissism uh, takes on new dimension as he uh, attends the hair club for men for a uh, job as a spokesmodel. Uh, oh, look here. Remember the Wheelo? Started in about 1965, I think, uh, Sparky, what was the company that put the Wheelo together? Uh, Whammo, Whammo. I think they were the same people that brought us the Frisbee and the Super Bowl. Well, what do you know? I hear by the theme music, it's time for our special visitor in Howland, none other than the legendary Mrs. Thurston Howell, Natalie Schaefer, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. I'm so glad you were able to stop by Howland this afternoon. I'm delighted to be here. I love to go to new places. Terrific. Can I offer you a drink or something to help you relax? Oh, uh, yes, we've I got all kinds of things. We have Tang and uh, Nestle's Quick, <laughs> Ovaltine. What do you feel like? Um, all of those are too mild for me. I like something really very strong, like Hawaiian punch. <laughs> <laughs> Just in time. Yeah. Fruit juicy. <laughs> got a can ready to burn here. We'll get you set up. On oh, rocks. it's very hard for you to open it. Right? Not used to manual labor. <laughs> oh, look, Play-Doh. That's not for me. I only like real dough, you know that. <laughs> I'm sorry, Mrs. Howe. We only use Monopoly money here in Howland. <laughs> here you go. Thank you. So tell our audience, uh, how life has been for you now that you're back in civilization, away from the island? Oh, it's so different here. Everybody's so fancy. They spend so much money on clothes. We didn't have to spend money. We, you know, we, I had the clothes. And what, I wore them twice sometimes. Could you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it seems that uh, most of us that watched you on Gilligan's Island for 20-some years now always wondered if there was any romantic pairing uh, amongst, the ca uh, amongst, amongst the castaways. Oh, not um, nearly enough to make it fun. <laughs> oh, come on. Since it's just you and me, spill the beans. Tell me what was going on in Ginger's hammock, you know? Well, Ginger's, <laughs> Ginger's hammock was a little bit empty for her, and I don't think she was too happy with that. Mm -hmm. She was used to a full hammock. What about uh, Marianne and uh, Gilligan? Did they ever manage to get together in three seasons? I don't think the get together that would have happened here. There was more clean fun on the island. Uh huh. Not enough sex, I didn't think. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think has uh, kept Gilligan's Island so popular for so long with all different age groups through the years? You know, I never knew why, because when I first saw the script, I thought it would lay an egg. And <laughs> it was such a surprise to have it go on and on and on. And I still don't know why, excepting that somebody relates in some way. Like my fan mail from children would say, my mother and father fight all the time. You and your husband never fight, do they? You and Minister Howell never fight. Well, we did sometimes, <laughs> a little bit. Do you keep in touch with some of the castaways now that you're all back into society life? Uh, yes. I was very friendly, of course, with my husband. Unfortunately, that had to end. And I'm very friendly with uh, Dawn Wells, 
the Marianne. Marianne, Marianne. <laughs> we mustn't have any other names. I like her very much. And uh, I love Bob Denver when I see him. You know, our lives all went in different directions. And where are you living now that you're back into Terribly civilized? Right Beverly Hills. Oh, really? <laughs> Seems appropriate. <laughs> where else? Do you prefer life on the west side to the tropical setting of Gilligan's Island? I love to go back to the island. I love the escape world. I love that you didn't have to go to benefits all the time. <laughs> and you didn't have to read about crimes and, and rape. Although I like to read about rape once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, it always seemed interesting to me that since there was a resident genius, so to speak, on the island with you, the professor, uh, that with all the inventions and creations that he conjured up, that there wasn't a way for him to design a raft or a boat for you to all leave the island and maybe move on to another set of another television show. Why don't you call and ask him? <laughs> I never knew why either. What is the professor doing? I don't know. I think he lives someplace else. I think he's doing something called voiceovers. Do you know what voiceovers are? No. Something that I like to do. You don't have to memorize. You don't have to hold your stomach in. You don't have to put on makeup. Sounds like my last relationship. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Have you been working recently? Uh, yes, I did a picture, but I don't want to mention it because it was a lousy picture. Uh huh. It was about Beverly Hills. Wow. It wasn't very good. You know, it seems that everyone these days is very interested in seeing reunions of the classic 60s shows. Uh, obviously, it would be hard for us to have a complete reunion of Gilligan's Island with the recent well, passing of Alan Hale and Jim Alan Backus. Alan Hale and, and Jim Backus kind of. We planned a reunion again, but God did something else to it. Anyway, uh -huh. uh, I think up there they give us messages once in a while, and we get ideas and think we may do them without them, but it'll never happen without them. So you don't sense there will be a reunion of the castaways? I wouldn't think so with three or two out of seven gone. Uh -huh. I don't think so. But I'd love to do a, a reunion with what's left of us if we could get on. Uh, I don't think it would happen. Okay. Uh, people have mentioned that uh, it was very difficult for you to endure all of the contraptions and the different uh, mechanisms that you had to use on the island. Was it a difficult show to produce? I didn't find it difficult. I loved being in the lagoon and climbing out and having my hat over my face and mm -hmm. mud on my face. And I loved that end of it. I think it was fun, and everybody had uh, comfortable enough places to live, and, and I don't know, I, 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 I'm very adaptable though, I can land any place. How does it strike you that uh, years and years after the show's initial airing, you're still getting a load of fan mail each week and are constantly being recognized as Mrs. Thurston Howell by young children that weren't even born when Gilligan's <laughs> Island was on. Well, I'm delighted when I'm recognized because I really didn't expect 25 years later to be recognized. So I think that's rather fun. But uh, I think the kids today love it, but the adults, all my fan mail comes from adults. Really? Now you're getting on to me and not to Mrs. Howell. Well, we have to fill in the blanks for the members of our audience that haven't kept up with their 60s pop culture. Well, they have a hard time to get away from Gilligan's Island. It's on three times every day. I know. It seems that it's on different channels and at all different and times. And <coughs> cable and uh, all over the world. My Lord, fan mail comes from Japan and, and from Australia and from Africa and from London and from mm -hmm. Germany. And it's Why amazing. do you think it would appeal to people outside of the United States? Well, I don't know why the United States would be. I, I think people relate in some way, and also I think something very important. There hasn't been enough laughter in the business. Mm -hmm. And I think laughter is very important, and I think people want to laugh. And Gilligan's Island, you can't help laughing. When I first went into it, I didn't think I'd ever laugh at it. I it was dreadful. But then I got so that um, I really fell in love with it. and then. We worked together, Jim Backus and I, on rewriting our parts and making them funnier. Really? And living a lot. So it, no, it wasn't all in the script, so to speak. No, no, no. In the script, I was written as a stuffy Pasadena lady who said, yes, dear, no, dear. And that's about uh -huh. all she said to her husband. Really? But, uh, Were you from Pasadena? I never knew where the no, house originated. No, I don't originated. even drive there. <laughs> I mean, it's too far away. But uh, <laughs> I liked, uh, I liked 
working with Jim. Uh -huh. And he always ad libbed, and I grew up in the theater where you never ad libbed. So it was an exciting new adventure. Right. And then I had permission to design my own clothes and plan my own wardrobe. And that was wonderful because it was very important that when this woman came on, that you knew what kind of a woman she was. And slacks and pearls and gloves and hats and feathers and things. She wasn't exactly a Pasadena lady. <laughs> Can I offer you a uh, couple of red vines I got burning right here? I, I think they probably fit in quite well with your outfit. No, thank you. They don't match. Really? <laughs> no, they're darker. Red vines, classics. <laughs> you know, it probably isn't really a, a fair question to ask, but I feel obligated since I try to operate on the cutting edge. Um, I've been told or I've picked up industry rumors through the years that Ginger wasn't really too happy with the success of Gilligan's Island. Uh, that it sort of typecast her as a pseudo Marilyn Monroe wannabe. Uh, do you think that it hurt the cast members of Gilligan's Island that the show became so popular? I think it changed your career. I mean, I was up for a lot of jobs that I didn't get because I was, it was not like Gilligan's Island. And right. they said, oh, she's on Gilligan's Island three times, you can't put her on as something else. And I'd been on a sadistic lesbian in The Killing of Sister George, they paid no that attention you. to that. That was me. <laughs> <laughs> you never thought think. it was my ex-girlfriend. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw you on The Brady Bunch, I think, one, yes. on one episode. You yes. played a millionaire architect developer oh, of property that worked with Mr. Brady. That's right. We were all typed uh, pretty strongly about Denver very much so, mm -hmm. Jim and I, and an awful lot of jobs uh, we couldn't have. The new young network people Mm -hmm. didn't approve. I mean, you know, they, they didn't know that we ever did anything else. I had a young network boy interview me one day, and he said, uh, now tell me, Ms. Schaefer, what have you done? And I looked at him, and you know, I said, you first. <laughs> and he t spent 20 minutes telling me what he did at the Yale Drama School. When wow. he fin finished, I said, thank you very much, and left. Well, I think it's only fair to mention that Gilligan's Island has always appealed to a very intellectual crowd as well as the uh, it has. middle of the television bell curve, it absolutely. Has. Because there was sort of an existential quality about the setting of a tropical island and seven people that really didn't fit together having to live with one another for three years. Similar to Jean-Paul Sartre's No Exit. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very funny simile. <laughs> I think that it's so unique that so many of the 60s shows, predominantly Gilligan's Island, have been able to recapture new audiences uh, every five, ten years. I think that really speaks highly for the production quality and the value of those programs. But I, I wonder about something. I wonder if they could do that kind of a show now, new. Gilligan's Island? Yes, that kind of show, that kind of comedy. I don't think they could do it now. I'm not sure they could do I it I think now. it would be hard. Yeah. My, my personal feeling with recreating 60s programs is that so many of these shows reflected the attitudes, the clothing styles uh, that were indigenous to that decade, the, the 60s, which in television terms was wildly creative and imaginative. But now, uh, since we've already been through the 70s with the Norman Lear shows that were so realistic, uh, television shows seem to try to be so real that an escapist show like Gilligan's Island might be difficult to reproduce. Yes, I think you have to kill somebody in the middle of it or choke somebody right. or choke ginger or something like that. Yeah, and I don't think that would really fit. <laughs> uh, what does my audience think? Should we add a little violence and degradation and dehumanization to the Gilligan's Island concept? Mm. Purist, Sparky, <laughs> I can always count on you. <laughs> Thing is, in today's market, the original show is still airing so frequently that I think it would be competing with the new version uh, as well. So it's not as if everyone has now forgotten the original show and would be able to accept the new version. It's a whole new generation, though, seeing it, too. And right. It's, you know, it's like a new show for them. But I thought we weren't supposed to be serious. I was supposed to play Mrs. Howell. <laughs> I've tried to upgrade in your honor, Mrs. Howell, because normally on Hal Land we reach to be such a gutter level that I've tried to act a little more sophisticated in your honor. One thing that I was always curious about, uh, the first season of Gilligan's Island was done in black and white, wasn't it? Oh, yes. 
I think do see. I always wondered because I thought maybe all of you had scurvy or some kind of ocean sickness <laughs> that lasted the first season. <laughs> no, and I think they, they tried to color it, didn't they, Lacey? Uh, I had heard they were going to colorize the yeah, first colorized. season, but fortunately the first season has really not been viewed very often on television, so I really enjoy seeing some of those earlier episodes. Uh, before Ginger had the attitude. Um, <laughs> so I think that it's nice that they have both available. Also, I think that one amazing quality of Gilligan's Island was the castaway's ability to find so many interesting things to do in such a primitive place. Was that uh, really something that came out of the script or was that decided no, on that amongst the, the cast? That was the script. Really? Yeah, I think so. There were always I, parties and dance contests. Oh, yes. and, and that was show Schwartz. Really? Yeah. What was your favorite show that you oh, remember? Oh, I liked the, my own. I liked playing Cinderella. That's right. You did play Cinderella. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> that was in one of the uh, dream sequences, was yes, it not? Yes, I loved it because first I was this mangy little girl, and then I was this glamorous. I sexy prayed to I that know. show. <laughs> And, and was Jim back as Prince Charming at oh, the end? Oh, of course. I mean, I wouldn't be unfaithful to my husband. What, did they use, like a bamboo slipper to put on your foot? <laughs> no, I don't know what they've used out of that, I remember. I think it was plastic or something. I don't know. Weren't Marianne and Ginger uh, a tad miffed that they were passed on for the role of Cinderella? I don't think we fought over anything. I think we, really? got, we got on pretty well. We took what came our way, you know? It I don't remember what Gilligan uh, played in that episode. I don't remember what he played. But you know, it was one week you were the star, and the next week you, somebody else was the star, and somebody uh -huh. else was the star, and that's the way he wrote it. And it was very smart to write it that way. So they really tried to shift it uh, between the cast members. Yeah. Were you relieved when the show finally was taken off the air? No. I thought I would be, because I couldn't believe I wanted to stay. But uh, I was very sad about it. Huh. And, and then when I realized what a change it was going to be, that everybody expected me to be that lady. Mm -hmm. Did it make it difficult to find jobs uh, immediately afterward? No, I went into another series called, uh, I forgot really? what it was, Lana Turner's Mother I played. And I was a crazy widow who escaped from a loony bin. I love that. Anything <laughs> crazy charms me. But um, <laughs> I can't kind of remember the name of it. I don't remember that either. I was so enamored by Gilligan that I began watching it in syndication immediately. <laughs> <laughs> I think that I speak for my audience when I say that here in Los Angeles, Gilligan's Island during the 60s and 70s ran twice a day, five days a week, and managed to keep us entertained, right? Yeah. Yeah. Am, I, am I on the mark here? Yeah. Whereas it seems today a lot of the, the new shows are on a few weeks and they're dust. They don't last. They don't seem to catch on as trends. They don't turn the show into a lunch kit or a pillowcase or anything that you can collect. Well, what bothers me really very much, so not because I love playing comedy, which I do, mm -hmm. but there isn't enough comedy, and there are not enough people who know how to play comedy, right. not enough people who know how to write or direct or produce comedy. Comedy seems to be the most difficult thing for them to do today, unless there's violence, you know. Except at my law firm. <laughs> the thing that... The thing that really is amazing, though, is that you really embody the quality of Mrs. Howell so perfectly that I sometimes think you were created before Mrs. Howell, uh, and no, they I, managed just to fit you into the... I created Mrs. Howell. I take all the bows and show which Watts gives me a pat on the back. Uh-huh. <laughs> but not friend. residuals. <laughs> <laughs> but, but did you, were you comfortable with the concept of Mrs. Howell, or did you want to maybe... No, I liked, I liked the way I designed, designed her. Uh -huh. I liked it that she developed that way. And as you mentioned, Jim and you would improvise a lot of your dialogue? Yes, and we'd meet on Sunday and rewrite scenes. And, and they were very nice about accepting it when we did it. And, uh -huh. and I think a little bit grateful. Really? Yeah, so it was good. We so never had any battles about it. Really? Nobody ever said, I didn't write that. You know, wow. and, the, and with different writers all the time, different directors. And it was, it was a very happy kind of making work. I thought it was wonderful that last year the Fox Late Show, with my assistance, uh, managed to facilitate a Gilligan's Island reunion where the entire cast, all seven of you, were together again with yeah. the producer of the show, Sherwood Schwartz. H how was that for you? I loved doing that. It was like going back to school. Uh huh. 
you know, graduating, going back and seeing all the same people, knowing we didn't have to see them too often, and it was <laughs> fine. Really? Attracted. Well, I think I really speak for my entire television audience and my studio audience when I say that Gilligan's Island has been a classic show that we've enjoyed for years and years and it's shows like Gilligan's Island and other wonderful syndicated television shows that have probably been the cause of my being functionally illiterate at this <laughs> point in my life because I still watch these shows on tape and on the cable network so that's I think right. we should all give a tremendous hand to Mrs. Thurston Howell, Natalie Schaefer, not only for appearing in Howland today, but for creating the legend of Gilligan's Island. Give it up for Mrs. Howell. And I'd like to give you, as a small token of my appreciation the Howland complimentary silly putty to take home with you <laughs> and I want you to feel free to help yourself to as much I bazooka as Joe as you feel you can <laughs> chew. Silly putty is my middle name. <laughs> it is perfect. Okay be, be careful you don't want to tilt it. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I'm glad that you were able to pop in Howland and sit in the beanbag chair a few minutes and reminisce the 60s pop culture with me. I uh, hope to see you again on next week's show. And for those of you that would like to say hello to the kid in person, I will be appearing live this weekend at the Whittier Chiropractors Convention. Uh, I've been honored. They've asked me to throw out the first back. How you doing? So uh, come out and say hello. In the meantime, take care of yourself. Be a mensch. And remember to get back to Howland as soon as possible. Take care. Right. Can I get your refill on the Hawaiian?